right, I think we're good to go. Annabelle, the numbers are going up. So without further ado. Go. Welcome back, everyone. Um, you are now in the panel uh, pr presentation. I know that time has flown. You can't believe that it's already 11, but it's true, it is already 11, and we will start our panel. For those of us that weren't here earlier um, or joined us a little bit late, I do want to give you just a brief um, summary of what to expect. We have four expert um, panelists with us today. We have the authors of the Ages and Stages questionnaires, um, Liz Twomley and Dr. Gentina Clifford with us here today. I think I saw Liz waving. <laughs> um, and we also have Ms. Christina Smith, she is one of two Florida ambassadors to the CDC's Learn the Signs Act Early initiative. Welcome, Christina. And we also have Sandra Bermudez, the president and CEO of the Lucy Project. Um, these expert panelists will be here with us um, sharing not only their knowledge, but answering many of our questions um, and responding to some commonly held beliefs um, we may call them myths. For the sake of, of fun, I'm going to call them the lies as part of our two truths and a lie. So the title of this panel presentation is that, two truths and a lie. Um, this is a very fun game that you may have played growing up where someone shares three statements um, and one of them is a lie and you have to figure out which one it is. Um, I'm going to kick off our discussion with two truths and a lie, but don't worry, no one has to come up with two truths or a lie. I know that's a lot of pressure. Okay, so let's get started. Most children um, reach milestones exactly when we expect them to. Um, developmental screenings, uh, tell us about how a child is learning and growing. And then the third statement is, if the children you love and care for have not reached an important milestone, it's not a big deal. They'll catch up. So you've been a part of uh, two trainings today, and I'm hoping that one of the big takeaways that you <laughs> got with that was that the state that it is true, developmental screenings tell us about how a child is learning and growing. And that it is also true that most children achieve milestones when they're expected to. Some will reach milestones a little bit earlier than we expect them to, and others um, may not reach developmental milestones when expected. So both of those statements are true. However, the statement that said, if children you love and care for have not reached a milestone, it's no big deal, they'll catch up, that is not true or the lie per se. That is a commonly held um, belief, mis misconception um, and our belief. And so today we're hoping to kind of dissect some of those and hear from the experts themselves. Um, our panelists are not only experts in their content, uh, early childhood development and exceptionalities, they are also experts in their experiences because they are mothers, um, or caregivers to children in their lives. And so uh, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and get us started with some general questions that I would love for our panelists just to kind of chime in um, and answer if they feel comfortable. I'll follow it up with some specific questions to each of our panelists, but at any point as a panelist, you can jump in, interject, or if you're itching to just kind of add to something a fellow panelist has said, please don't hesitate. Um, we do have my colleague Eileen Suazo monitoring the chat for questions from you, the participants. So this is your opportunity to ask us um, and ask our panelists anything that has been weighing heavily on you. Um, Eileen will be the one reading these out to us and we'll be able um, to build on the conversation, all right? Okay, so here we go. Um, again, this is a general question and feel free to jump in and answer. How do you balance communicating the importance of early detection and intervention while ensuring that educators and families also understand that all children develop differently and at their own pace? I 
I know it's a tough one. <laughs> Uh, um, I can start. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sandra can start if she wants. It's all good, Christina. <laughs> um, uh, I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> so basically, as far as it comes into literacy, we more often than not get uh, parents that are already very worried about their children. And more often than not, by the time they reach us, they tell us that they have been told that their child is a late bloomer and that they're going to catch up in second or third grade. And while there is uh, time to, to catch up, that would require some serious intervention. If a child can't decode CBC words in first grade, that's, that's pretty serious. So we wanna reassure them that there is help available, but if, if, if your child is running behind in the milestones, the best day to start working on it is today. Agreed, today. <laughs> If your child is falling behind on their developmental milestones, the best day to start is today. Thank you. Christina, I know you wanted to chime in. Um, I was just going to add to that. That's one of the things with the um, early intervention project that I work with with the CDC we do is provide user-friendly materials and uh, a phone application where parents and uh, educators actually can use it as well. Put in the information of the child. It's all anonymous, so you don't have to worry about it being shared or anything like that. And it basically will give red flags if your child is not meeting developmental milestones, and it gives the appropriate amount of time to wait. So um, I think I definitely agree with Sandra. Uh, my son is diagnosed with autism um, level two, and my daughter actually with ADHD and recently autism level one. So with my son, it was very classical symptoms. And so it was very hard to ignore. But in other cases, as an educator, I have run into um, discussions with caregivers. Oh, but we can wait for speech therapy or we can wait for these things. And I think what I tell them is you can wait, but their peers are already going to start meeting more milestones and developing. And if you get the interventions that they need now, um, they will be more likely to uh, not suffer later with, um, you know, falling further behind, like Sandra was saying, in the early um, grades of elementary school. And also another thing to consider is the way that our public schools are run and, and schools in general, they have to have a certain amount of time to take data so that they can provide the correct interventions. And so that's also, quote unquote, waiting time. Um, you know, it's usually around six weeks to six months that that occurs. So um, I definitely agree. The best day is today. And just try to provide the information in a very user friendly, warm, compassionate way so that, um, you know, the parents and caregivers also feel seen and heard in their concerns because they are the experts on their child. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think this, you, you mentioned that this wait and see approach is one that uh, has been brought to you often. And I think San Sandra mentioned the same thing, you know, by the time families reach them, they've been told, you know, that the child would catch up or that um, they, would, they still needed more time. Um, would you say that that's the most common misconception around screening and early detection? Um, the wait and see. <clears throat> I think so. I think we just think of, you know, sometimes as children as these, you know, just little people, well, they are little people, but um, that they have all this time to grow. And that's absolutely true. It's just that, you know, I, we also like to say to parents, there's so many things, you know, like health, little health things or ear infection, you know, small things that we want to make sure are not playing into what's going on with their child. And that that the things we do with kids at this age are just fun, developmentally supportive activities that aren't scary or weird. And they, we're just trying to ensure that all children have that opportunity. And I think going back to the, you know, a very simple statement, if you can um, frame it for parents, just that it's the, mo it's the most rapid period of brain development in a child's life. So we don't want to wait. We don't want to wait. We want to get on it as quickly as possible because there's so many things we can do. They're simple, they're fun, they're interactive, and um, that we just maximize that child's ability to really flourish. And so we want to do that as early as possible. Thank you. Can I piggyback on that too, real quickly? 
because I think this is such a great question. Um, and I think a, a big part of it, I've heard people talk about, it's important to be able to talk to parents warmly and reassuringly, and there's fun things to do. I think the more the provider feels comfortable with um, the fun things to do and the activities and the connections with people in the community that are there to help, that the parent's going to feel that too. So yeah, all children do develop at different rates and some kids really benefit from extra supports and services. And we have awesome supports and services and people to help us and it's really easy to access them and it's fun. So to kind of normalize the other side of it too, I think can be really reassuring for families. Um, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I wanted to mention that very often we see parents that don't want to know. Um, in the case of dyslexia, it's something that runs in families. So often parents already have their own trauma and don't want to know or believe that their child has, um, that could use some extra help. And I think the way we deliver this information is very important that we, they realize that we are here to support all of you. And that, believe it or not, this is pretty common. I think it's sharing our own experience here as experts, but also as parents, is incredibly helpful for everyone. We need to get rid of the stigma. It's very common. We do have a question in the chat. I just want to interrupt really quickly. Amanda is asking or mentioning that she often finds that parents are unable to afford to get the children assessed after the screenings are completed in school. So maybe this is something you all could address. So I worked with this quite frequently as well in early childhood. And I think um, for the different places that I've worked, I created a community resources binder, if you will. It was like a live binder. And I would, I mean, I would ask pretty personal questions like what health insurance do you have and things like that so that I could um, put them in the right direction because different providers provide different services to different insurance companies. But there are a lot of free services, especially in Florida. And I do think that is something that needs to be addressed a little bit more fully is connecting between schools and providers. Um, but we have in Florida too, the community screenings um, is in usually in university settings where I work at University of South Florida, we have an intervention and evaluation center that is completely free. The wait list can be lengthy two to three months, but they will do all the services free and contact um, if there is a diagnosis or services that need to be offered, they will connect the parents, um, even counseling for the family. So I think it's really about um, maybe connecting the professionals in the school setting with the community, like was mentioned earlier. The more, I think um, Ms. Clifford said that, it, the more we're comfortable with what's offered, the better we'll be able to provide that for the parents and caregivers. So I think there's a lot of different routes you can go, but in general, the treatments that are used for children with diagnosis, they can be very costly. And I'm seeing more stipends and grants and other scholarships too for families that aren't really bound by income. So that's really nice to see. So I think just connecting with the the guidance counselors, the school psychologists, the social workers within the school setting, um, they're all there to support the families to find those resources as well and um, in, a, in a timely manner too. And universities are a really great place to start because um, they have Center for Autism and Related Disorders that offer services free and um, uh, other community resources. So tapping into those, they can point caregivers in the right direction. Yes, thank you. And I hate to interrupt this conversation, but I have noticed that there's some difficulty with the Spanish translation. So the Spanish interpreters, um, the their, whoever is interpreting for our Spanish uh, language participants, they cannot hear. I don't, it may be the connection that you have currently, or maybe your sound. So if there um, is a possibility for another interpreter to jump in, I just don't want the participants who are listening to this in Spanish to miss out on the really valuable information um, that our experts are sharing. Um, 
es, es, sí estoy de, es, nos han informado que no se puede oír muy bien en español. En este momento estamos comunicándonos con las personas que están encargadas de la interpretación en español y están haciendo algunos ajustes para que puedan oír toda la información que se está compartiendo. Um, Again, this is available for interpretation and translation in both Spanish and Creole. Asegúrense que están, que han seleccionado interpretación en la parte de abajo de sus pantallas y que han seleccionado español. Y uh, como les expliqué, estamos en este momento um, trabajando con los interpretadores para que ajusten sus, sus settings. <laughs> no sé la palabra exacta. Okay. So I was just sharing that. Um, Uh, please know that we have notified the Spanish language interpreters that they cannot be held very oh they are so we're getting some feedback from the chat they can hear you very well now so thank you very much all right so um that I think was really important information that you shared Christina there are resources free resources in our community for families who are having difficulty with the cost of intervention Um, and I think your suggestion to reach out to other folks at your school, whether it's your director, your owner, a social worker, a community agency, um, the warm line, right? In many of our previous sessions, we've talked about the warm line in Miami-Dade County and Monroe. We have a warm line that is available to providers, um, and we'll share that information with you at the very end. Um, but the warm line is in place for just that, to help connect you with additional resources in the event that the ones you have maybe are not accessible, or maybe you're new to this whole um, world of early intervention and you just need a place to start. Um, the warm line is a great, 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 is a great tool and resource. And so I'm now going to move on to the kind of more specific questions. But like I mentioned earlier, if you want to add to something that the, the panelists that I address uh, does share, um, we really want to, want to hear that too. So I'm going to start in no particular order, but I'll start with Dr. Gentina Clifford. Um, Dr. Clifford, in your biography, you mentioned that you provide technical assistance and training um, all over the country. Um, and internationally on screening tools, right? Mm -hmm. um, you were an early childhood educator for eight years. So you were in the shoes of um, many of our participants. Um, and you've also been faculty at the University of Oregon's early intervention program for 15 years, meaning that you are now working with professionals. You're doing teacher training um, and helping them kind of become experts in this tool. We hear often from educators from teachers, um, we don't have time. We don't have time to administer these tools. They take too long. Um, how much training um, or, or the training is, is really extensive. We're not prepared to deliver these tools. How much training would you say is needed to administer a developmental screening tool? That's such a great question. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I, You know, I know that you're able to do a couple hours of training in Florida because we've been working really closely with um, coaches and trainers in Florida to, to figure out how can we get the gist of this information and how to use um, these tools well with families. I often liken it to a pair of scissors. It's pretty easy to learn how to use a pair of scissors, but then if you want to go give somebody a haircut, it helps to have some training, right? Because <laughs> you need to individualize your haircuts. You've got lots of different types of hair that you're working with, yeah. right? Um, and so training is really useful and helpful so that you're using this tool sensitively and individualizing. So I think, you know, That's all. I don't have a. I don't have like a. This is the right amount of time answer. I think it's continued learning. I think it's getting some learning, reading about it. Um, if you have access to the user's guide, that's you know some of us like to go there. Talking to other people who have been using it, leaning on your coaches, going, getting together with others, and you know half an hour here, half an hour there. I think two hours is probably a good amount of time to really get a sense. Liz, I see you shaking your head too, nodding your head, not shaking your head. Because um, this is something that we talk about a lot. How do we get this 
support to providers. So they really understand that this tool is there to be used in a positive strength-based family-friendly way. And we're identifying strengths as well as helping to identify areas where support could be helpful. And we're using it in a, in a positive, I wanna help your child way. So I don't really have, uh, this is the amount of time that it takes. And I also <laughs> wanna acknowledge that I know that early childhood providers and child care providers are super busy and they've got a lot on their plates. So we recommend kind of, you know, sending it home, getting parents to do it. They can see a lot of things and then setting up activities, doing it in the classroom. Like don't pull kids out to do it, do it, make fun games, find motor activities that are happening. And you can see a lot of things on the ASQ happening right there. Most kids are going to be doing many, if not all of the skills on the ASQ. So you don't even need to try them. You just see them happening. So that's kind of my two cents. And I bet Liz has something to add and maybe Sandra and Christina too. Yeah, I, I, that's totally true. I agree with everything Jantine is saying. It's hard to set a time. But, and what we've tried to do in Florida is say as providers and teachers, Really, if you can learn how to introduce this tool, like you understand the tool, you can introduce it to families um, in a simple and positive manner that this isn't about, this is about supporting your child, supporting your child in the classroom. And then it's just a matter of really, you know, supporting them to try activities with their child or making sure that you do provide those opportunities in the classroom and see them. That's really all it is. It's a very simple questionnaire. The complexity comes in how you freight, how you support families and how you talk about screening in a way that's non-threatening. So, you know, in Florida, your ELC can then pick up a lot of the interpretation and help with that piece and the next steps and support you in that. And like Jantina was saying, leaning on those coaches is really important. But if you can just get straight, what is this tool? How do I talk about it? How do I you know, reassure parents and support them through this process? That's really your role. And um, so hopefully you know, a couple hours of training helps you have the language you need to really um, help getting that ball rolling and supporting families. Thank you, thank you so much. I heard both of you mention um, the importance of including the families in the screening process. Um, but we've also heard from many of, of our early educators and early child care providers that the responses of families may not be the most accurate. You know, like, you know, the, the parent has completed the screening tool and they've uh, said, you know, a child is doing X, Y, Z, but that's not happening in my classroom. I don't think this is an accurate screening. Um, would you say that the results of a screening tool um, are more accurate or valid if they're only administered by teachers um, or educators? No, yes. <laughs> I don't think we would say that. However, you know, it, the situation the way it is now in Florida where parents go in and they possibly complete that tool online very quickly without the materials, without the time they need, you're not going to get super accurate results. So ideally you can figure out your systems for getting to the parents early, um, making sure they have some support, making sure they have access to materials. And in the end, you will end up doing a lot of these screenings, I think, in but we do want you to engage families, let them understand what the tool is, know, you know, have that opportunity to meaningfully help complete it um, and the support they need to complete it. Or that's fine too. But right now, you know, I think some of the inaccuracies come from the fact that they're just done way too quickly online after a long, you know, process of entering information. And that's not going to make for an accurate screening. These tools take a they do take some time, especially when you're preschool age to try items and really think about it. So I don't know, Jantina, anything else you want to um, no, I just I would second everything that Liz says too. I mean, the only other thing that comes to mind is, you know, um, teachers can complete these tools and they see a kids do a lot of things. So, you know, um, and I think that the hurried nature is is when errors are going to happen. You're, you're not going to see a child do something. And then if they're getting a lot of not yets on something, then it's maybe looking like, you know, you're going to 
you, your results might not be accurate or parents are guessing. Um, one thing that I do like to say is if if teachers are completing the ASQ, so if a parent, defer, excuse me, defers and it falls on the teacher, put yes on everything you're seeing the child do. You know, sometimes if they're starting to do it, but if you're not seeing a child do a skill yet on the ASQ, I think it's really nice if you can resist the temptation to mark not yet and put a question mark there. And then that's your opportunity to follow up with a parent and say, hey, we're seeing your child do all these amazing things. They're doing this, they're doing that, they're starting to do this at school, but we're not seeing this yet. And I wanted to reach out with you because you're the expert on your child's development and say, what are they doing at home? You know, because some kids, it takes a while to warm up at school. There may be things they're not comfortable doing yet. Are you seeing this at home? Can you help me complete this? Um, so I just say, you know, if you're not seeing it at school, don't mark not yet. Keep that door open. That's your opportunity to partner with a parent and let them know they're the expert and you respect that expertise and want to include them in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clifford. Oh. Earlier in our introduction, we talked a little bit about having these conversations with families. And just like you mentioned, not just to celebrate the milestones that they have reached, but to start asking questions about the things that maybe you're not seeing. And I think that um, that's an important transition for us to make as a, as a community here in South Florida. Um, and I know that our screening team is, is up to the challenge, you know, how can we better administer this tool so that we're using it as a, um, talking point and an opportunity to build a relationship or to start communication with families if we haven't already. Um, I had a question specifically for Liz, for Ms. Twomley, I was going to call you Liz, <laughs> for Liz, um, you train, uh, you provide technical assistance and training as well. Um, you're doing it in diverse settings, not just with educators, but social workers um, and other professionals. What do you think has been the most effective uh, support you've given to help um, teachers with the ability to assist in, in identifying and assisting young children who may need additional supports? Um, so your uh, past screening, what are the strategies kind of for working with children? And is that what have you seen has been, um, I guess, what support that you have provided has been the most effective in helping teachers kind of build the confidence that they need to have these conversations or to administer tools, you know, with, with confidence? Yeah, I think, you know, role playing, you know, trying out these conversations with a friend, especially if you think you're going into maybe, you know, a conversation with a parent who um, is really, um, you know, where it may be a little questionable what's going on. It's very gray. The child is, is missing some important skills that, so you're not sure how that conversation is going to go. Again, I, I think I would encourage Jantina's, the coaching is really important. So reaching out to your ELC and Asking to talk to the coach and kind of prepare for that conversation is really important because it's very easy to get very nervous, just want to go, oh, your child isn't doing these things and we really need to get more information. You know, want to just slow down, take your time and um, ease into that conversation. And I think, try, you know, practicing that a little bit, kind of how are you going to start? Are you going to start with strengths and, you know, how much you love, you know, having this child in your classroom? Um, you know, really appreciating that person and then talking about, you know, it would be nice to get more information on what's going on for your child because there's many things that could be playing into why we aren't seeing some of these things in the classroom yet. So that piece as well as, you know, the reassurance that, you know, e even if a child goes through a process like this, that we're going to be able to um, do, there, you have the skills in the classroom, you know, it's just a matter of making those opportunities available to a child and remembering this little guy needs, you know, needs those prompts, needs that little bit of support. So it's not super complicated, but it does require some focus. And um, you can really um, pair with your coaches to think about where can we provide those opportunities in the classroom to practice these things or put in you know, picture symbols or something that's going to make this easier for the child in the in the classroom um, to just navigate. Um, and it, hopefully everybody's life is easier, right? If we get those simple supports for that child in the classroom, 
um, that's going to make the day flow easier. So it's both to your advantage and obviously to this child's advantage to have some of those supports in place. Yes, and in the chat, as our participants are listening, one of them is uh, Eva Guido mentioned, uh, make the sandwich. And I think she's referring to the strategy. Some call it the Oreo cookie. Some call it the sandwich where you um, kind of uh, layer the positive um, and place uh, the, the request for additional supports um, mm -hmm. in the middle or where you identify where the child may have some needs in the middle. So you start off with something positive. You follow <laughs> it with um, where the child may have some needs, and then you you close out the conversation again with another strength or something positive about the child. Um, um, I, go ahead. I, I would like to add something that we have found very helpful is that parents want to have, they want to know that there's some agency that they actually can help. So in, in the case of literacy, we always give them some recommendations of things they can do that afternoon that they can do throughout the week because it makes one, they're engaged and two, they are truthfully helping their child and it helps sometimes soften the blow of, of what's happening at that moment. That is a great suggestion. So not just a sandwich, but maybe some activities, ending your conversation with, there's something that you can start doing immediately or there's some things that you can begin doing at home. And I think you're right, it gives families the power, it empowers them again and reminds them that, that they don't have to wait for an expert or a teacher or an interventionist. They can start now um, to make an impact. So that I think that's a great addition. The, can I chime in real quickly too? Sorry, Christina, were you? <laughs> well, I was just going to say on the ASQ website, there's a plethora of resources that have activities. So if your child is kind of in the gray area or not meeting certain milestones, you can give the list of activities to the parents both for the ASQ3, as I know you guys know, <laughs> and ASQSC, which I found super helpful. And I would also do um, professional development for parents. So we'd have a parents night where there's fun activities that kind of meet some of those milestones. And we presented the ASQ and whatever other types of assessment and screening we did at our school um, in a friendly way, user-friendly words, just the same as before. Um, and but make it fun so they could bring the, the kids do an activity and then we talked about what milestones they're meeting while doing this activity and just like um, Ms. Clifford said earlier when you're doing the ASQs as child you know I'm an early childhood educator I actually went back to the classroom as a behavior specialist and I'm getting my um, hours to be a behavior analyst so I'm back in the classroom working one-on-one -on -one, and what I find to be the most useful is just those open and honest conversations with parents and like you mentioned in a non-threatening way so those activities are things that they all should have at home very easy access markers scissors um things like that and and it goes kind of list by list of things that they can do and i think uh that makes the parent also feel very um invested in their child's learning and starting that relationship with the parents from day one. So we also, like at the beginning of my class, I'm with three-year-olds this year, give the best way to communicate. Is it by phone? Is it by email? You know, and then also when is the best time? And do you prefer these types of conversations that pick up and drop off? I do not prefer them in front of the child because no matter how young they are, they are hearing them. So I prefer if we can to have them apart um, so can you come a little bit earlier before you pick up and I'll step out so that I can chat with you for a minute. But that's what I was going to say. I love the ASQ. Very uh, useful because there's so many resources besides the actual screening tool. And online, I believe there's also a training for educators, but I like condensed it a little bit and I made a Zoom link so that when we had new hires, because in early childhood, there is a lot of turnover. So um, it was very friendly. And then I made a shorter quiz. So I used the resources from ASQ, did a Zoom link. I could send it to any new teacher we had. They just like the DCF hours, they had that amount of time to complete it so that they were aware that that's the type of screening and assessment. Very short quiz after. And then we counted it. We gave them a PD certificate. So that was something that I did. Um, as a behavior specialist that I found super helpful for educators and parents. 
Thank you. And I want to say that this wasn't planned at all, but as part of our raffle later this afternoon is the learning activities from the ASQ in English and Spanish. And so um, the activities that Christina just uh, talked about are going to be available to a lucky raffle winner. So um, we're very excited. I also wanted to pause because I see some hands going up, um, but I know that our participants cannot um, they don't have a speaker function. So if you raised your hands, please make sure that you type your question or comment in the chat or the Q&A where we'll be able to, um, to answer it. So I'm going to direct the next question specifically to Sandra. Um, and I want to kind of start by introducing you briefly. Um, you are a mother of a child with a disability. She is 16 years old um, and she has dyslexia. Um, you have been a dedicated advocate and continue to be a dedicated advocacy for literacy and the science of reading. What do you tell people? Um, and you talked about it briefly in, in, a, in another question, but what do you say to those who tell you that dyslexia isn't going to show up until elementary school? I say that is patently false. Um, at a very young age in the preschool years, you really can't do an assessment for dyslexia, but you can do an assessment for foundational skills that um, will precede the, the, the possibility of reading and writing. In other words, you can already tell if the child is being able to connect the sound of the language with a, with a letter that represents it. And there's also like very simple family history questionnaires or even teacher questionnaires that you can triangulate and quickly see what children are not necessarily dyslexic, but do have tendencies or characteristics of uh, dyslexia. And thus they're gonna need some extra support, dyslexia or no dyslexia. Thank you, thank you so much. As a mother of a child with dyslexia, what, impact do you think early intervention, early identification and intervention um, has had on her academic trajectory um, and or her social emotional development? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. So in, in, the, in my case, my daughter was not diagnosed until first grade and we already knew something was off, but we, we didn't know what it was. So we kept on asking, the school and they kept on telling us, oh, she's a late bloomer. Maybe if she tries harder, maybe if you read more to her, which was disconcerting to us. But the truth of the matter is that looking back now, um, we knew our daughter could not rhyme. She did not understand rhyming. She couldn't memorize the rhymes. She um, would would confuse, she had baby talk for a very long time. So instead of spaghetti was paschetti and this lasted a long time, she couldn't tell right from left, um, she, she could not, she couldn't, she had a very hard time memorizing her ABCs. And any of these elements, if it's just one, it's fine, it's common. But when you have all these elements at the same time, a teacher can identify that and say, okay, we have an issue here. That's where the screeners come in. Let's help this child, let's help these parents. And instead, in our case, we had to wait till first grade and by then her self-esteem was honestly shot because she thought she wasn't smart because she wasn't learning how to read as fast as the other kids. Some of the other kids were bullying her and making fun of her because she couldn't read. And now, I mean, fast forward today, she's in 10th grade, an honor roll student and has a bright future ahead of herself. But we had to play catch up and playing catch up, the older you are, the harder it is. And it becomes also very, very expensive. So can it be done? Yes. Do we want to avoid doing it? Absolutely. Um, and I am seeing in the chat, uh, there is a lot of interest in learning more about um, screening tools and resources that pre-K teachers um, could access uh, that could maybe identify some early literacy uh, red flags. So um, I don't know if you have any that you'd like to share off that or if you um, could share uh, later on with our participants. But they, I, I do want to acknowledge that there's a lot of interest in the chat around this topic. Absolutely. Basically, what you need is a, a, a traditional, um, you know, literacy uh, screener. And then you what you do is you triangulate with the parents and the teacher questionnaire. 
And the parent questionnaire is really to learn about if the parents have had difficulties, if they struggle with reading, if they struggle with school, and to try to understand what the teacher is seeing. Does the child struggle with, um, with mobility? Are they accident prone? Do they struggle to learn how to write? All these things, once again, one on its own, it's not a big deal, but, when it, but it does have a cumulative effect. And once you see that the teacher's concerned, the parents are concerned, you, and the, the, whoever's doing the screen sees that the child cannot correlate the phoneme to the graphing, the sound to the letter, you know there's some phonological awareness issues and you can start working on that. And by this, I do not mean start hammering the child on developmental skills that are inappropriate for their age, but just by playing games in the classroom, by reading to the child to help them with vocabulary. I mean, that's, that's a big game changer. Thank you. So we have a great question on the chat that I thought you all could um, explore. There's someone who's mentioning as a parent, if they have a concern for their child, should they first consult their pediatrician? That's, it, it depends on the pediatrician. There's a big <laughs> push to get pediatricians to understand all these, um, not only the milestones, but like the issues with literacy. And some of them are well-versed, uh, but many are not. I think your first point of contact is always the school. And if the teacher is not uh, perhaps understanding your concerns, I would definitely go up to wherever it takes. Because as I said before, the, the time to take care of it is now. And it does take quite a bit of uh, agency and advocacy to speak for your child. But as always, we are, we are the experts on our kids. We are the ones that know. So it is our job to push. I, I would like to add also that, um, there are many websites, including ours, uh, lucyproject.org, that speak about the science of reading and how children learn how to read. And I think that's that's a first step to understand. Thank you. I think sharing that information about your website is really important. And thank you, Eileen, for adding it to the chat. Um, we do have some of, of our participants that want and really want to know more about early literacy and uh, um, any type of tool or screening assessment that, that can help connect families to supports if needed. Um, the question that came up in the chat was actually part of my list of questions. So thank you to the participant who asked it. Um, and I wanted to pose it to specifically to Christina. Um, some professionals and some families think that physicians are the only ones who can and should refer um, children to early intervention. Do, I know that Sandra shared, you know, that this isn't necessarily true or has uh, not necessarily been true in her experiences as it relates to dyslexia. How would you, do you think that that is true as it relates to other um, areas of development? Should the, is the physician the best referral source? Um, I agree with Sandra. It's really not, and it's not to discredit the many years that you know, doctors go to school and what they learn. But what I'm seeing, especially with my work with the CDC, we're trying to bridge that gap and give some curriculum enhancements to resident doctors and things like that about early childhood. Because in my own experience, probably similar to Sandra, um, like I said before, my son um, was diagnosed at two years old with autism spectrum disorder, but I knew at 13 months old. Um, I studied psychology and worked with autistic individuals pretty much my whole life. And so um, it was very difficult to get him diagnosed. And um, luckily, I was able to get other therapies. But I think the misconception about that comes kind of like as a societal view, um, especially with early childhood educators, our education is pretty varied. Um, you can have, you know, different uh, associates, you can have a certificate, you can have a bachelor's. And so that is difficult. But I think we really have to advocate in, in our workplaces and say that we are specialists in this. We study, we do this many hours of professional development. And we are the advocates too for the children in our class. Um, I always know that my classroom kids were like my kids. I would fight for them if I if I saw that they needed something. And it comes to in in basically validating that we are a profession and that we um, are just like any of the other professions. This is our specialization in what we do day to day. Now, I think it's important for the community to rally together and really form a team. And what I say with my parents and my co-teacher, for example, is we're a partnership. And so if one 
person, you know, it's kind of like a seesaw, you know, if one person isn't, is doing, is saying it this way and the other is saying it this way, you don't really create a balance. And so with physicians, we actually came into contact with the doc doctor of nurse practicing when we moved to Florida and my son still sees her and she's technically a nurse practitioner. She's not a doctor, but she listened to all of my concerns. And she was really the first person that said, I understand your mom, you know, and so sometimes we have to say, because a, a pediatrician might say, no, just like the wait and see. I hear that so many times. And, and you have to say it as the parent, well, I'm the parent and I want this referral. This is why I want this referral, X, Y, Z. And a lot of the pediatricians also use the ASQ. It's very common, but they'll do it like Ms. Clifford said, very hurriedly or, you know, dismiss. Pediatricians also have the ability to to diagnose a lot of times ADHD. And so it, it's just really creating that, that trust and partnership in the community. And I would say, um, you know, when families discredit that, you can say, well, you can get many opinions if you want, and you can write down the things that you're noticing and observing, and you can take my observations, and you can take the pediatrician's observations, and then like Sandra said, go to a specialist that's in dyslexia, you're looking at reading, so go to a reading specialist. If you're looking at things, for example, that are off about development, I always recommend my parents, a lot of times they'll go to a psychologist or neurologist, and I say pediatric neurology has the ability to see if there's underlining medical things that I think Liz mentioned earlier. So it's just really about forming that alliance with each other, that we're not against each other, that we're not competing for who is best. We're really creating that partnership. So uh, I know I don't like to put the letters behind my name, but sometimes I have had to. And I have an MS and I actually have two and I have a postgraduate. And so I tell them, these are the things that I have done to create more knowledge and more ability to help these children and these families. And so really advocating for our field in early childhood is important. But, um, you know, if you think about the hours that a child spends because of, you know, the necessity of work, both parents have to work these days. The, ch the teacher spends a lot of time with your child, um, yeah. an incredible amount of time and love and care that we pour in. So um, I think it's important to realize that, that they, they do know your child and want the best for them. So that, that would be my answer. And then I, we can talk more too about the resources that we have available. Um, I didn't really think uh, to raffle them because they're available for free, but I would love to <laughs> put anybody in contact with how to get those materials or if an organization wants a bulk order of the books or or I can show to how to download the app. I would love that because that it's not screening like what Ms. Clifford and Liz do. It's um it's more of a intervention tool. So we're seeing if they're meeting those developmental milestones and then we work with screening tools such as the ASQ afterwards. So it's kind of like the first step. Um, and it it actually has activities and things you can do with your child as well. So that could be um, a nice point where the parent engages with the teacher to um, show what they're learning too about the about um, the early childhood development. So I think it's a partnership, and it's it's come a long way, but we still have a ways to go. I agree. And I think what you said about empowering families, reminding them that they're the experts on their child so that if they reach out to one professional and that professional doesn't validate the way they're feeling, they can go to someone else mm -hmm. and they can continue to go to someone else until someone validates <laughs> their concerns and helps them get access to more screenings or more evaluations. Um, the, the only negative thing that could come from that is, you know, it, I, I really don't see one. It gives you peace of mind. You know, I was about to say there's something negative about screen evaluation. There isn't. Um, once you go through the process, you get the peace of mind of either knowing it's not a concern yet or here are the resources that I could potentially access. So I think it's incredible value. And the same is true for educators, because I know we have a lot of educators on the screen. Um, feel empowered. Like Christina said, feel like the professional you are. You know, we're not telling you to go out and tell a family this child has XYZ. 
you're not a, a diagnostician um, or an assessor, but you are an early educator. So you can say everything is on, uh, I think um, in the ASQ session, Melissa called it, you know, everything's on track where, where we should be going. Or you can say, there's some things that I'm noticing, you know, do you notice these at home? Okay, this is something that maybe we need to get a professional to evaluate. Um, and those conversations uh, come from after a, a, some rapport building. And like we mentioned earlier, a lot of positivity. Um, I wanted to uh, bring attention to kind of the diversity and complexity of South Florida. And I'm, and I, I guess I also want to acknowledge that South Florida is not the only place where there is a lot of complexity and diversity. Um, but we often hear from families who are not native English speakers, um, educators uh, who work with families that speak another language other than English, whether it is Russian, Spanish, or Haitian Creole. And they have questions about the role language plays um, as it relates to disability or flagging with disability. Would either, were, would any of you say that the disabilities or concerns that we've discussed only show up in English or only show up in one language? I see Sandra shaking her head. <laughs> um, no, it definitely shows up in, in all languages. And at the same time, to, I think to dismiss someone, oh no, it's just because you speak Spanish. No, it's that's just dismissing the reality of the child. That's her love language, whatever the parents speak. And, a disability is, is beyond the match. So a child who is showing some signs of dyslexia or struggles with early literacy in English could potentially also show those in Spanish? Yes, definitely. And it, it's just, you know, if, if you are learning two languages, uh, learning will take a little bit longer. They will catch up. But if they're having the same issues, I mean, it's it's still dyslexia no matter what language it is. Of course, some languages are friendlier. Mm -hmm. um, Italian, for example, is a lot easier because there's less, um, it, it, it's just, there's a, an exact pattern or code that you follow. English is a bit harder, but it's still the same brain, brain and body of the child. So it doesn't really make a difference. Thank you. Did anyone want to add to that, that concern about languages and, and development? I just wanted to say that, you know, we, the ASQ is translated into some other languages, but anytime you're, you are working with a family who has a child who speaks another language and is coming from perhaps a very different cultural experience or home environment, you know, that <clears throat> as was mentioned in the um, trainings, there's a lot of ways to adapt um, questions um, and make them more relevant to families, but in the end, um, you know, the results should be interpreted with caution. Um, as with anything, many things play in. One of the things is going to be the lang home language and what's going on in the home in terms of acquisition. You, so again, it just comes back to if you see something, you want to get some more information and you want to go to specialists who can help you figure out, is this because it was administered in another language or because this child's coming from a different home culture? Or is there truly something that we can support at this age? So to just get more information, play it safe, just get more information. You know, it's always, always a good way to start. Thank you. And, and I think we're, we're now transitioning into questions about um, s delivering supports, right? So now we have used the screening tools or identified that the child could need additional help and you are in the early childhood classroom, right? Um, Christina, as an early interventionist, what is your preferred place um, to deliver early intervention? Or do you, do you feel like you need a standalone or separate room in the classroom to deliver intervention? Um, and, and why? I love to do it in the classroom. I love to have push in services rather than push out services because I work in behavior. So then we have to generalize it to either the home setting or another place. And sometimes it takes longer or sometimes it may not happen for different environmental factors. So I had to do in my master's, I remember, like make my own school and make my own plan and all the services were push in services. And what I found while I was doing that research was that it actually is easier. It's easier for the parents because then they don't have to take off a of work 
um, and try to take them to different therapists. I will say a lot of therapy um, places are offering speech, occupational, ABA, different things in one setting. So that's really great. Um, but I know that um, when I was starting off young and fresh, one thing that I really utilized was called Kara's Kits. And so Kara's Kits was just this little bitty flip book and you could do the accommodations. They still have it. You can look it up online. And it was literally like, for example, if they were having trouble with fine motor, cut a pool noodle and put it on the pencil and things like that. And in very cost friendly. But I think that, um, you know, it can be harder to do interventions in the classroom if the teacher does not have that teacher efficacy. They have to feel like they are able to do this. But I think Sandra mentioned earlier, a lot of things are uh, very simple. It comes down to just educating yourself and then following through with that. Um, but yeah, as an early interventionist, I definitely, I've made fine motor bags to send home with parents and basically said, here are some things like a pipe cleaner and beads, and you can do this while you're cooking supper. Because I know as a busy mom, my son at one point had seven different therapies and it's very difficult. And so I went to the stove and I set him up and then I, you know, set my daughter up and then I cooked dinner and then, and they were still engaged. They were, and, you know, make things that are interesting for the child. So if I'm going to make something um, for a child to cut, what do they like? What characters do they like? What, um, you know, themes do they like? What colors do they like? Nothing's better than someone's favorite color. I love green, <laughs> green, green, green. I have a child in my class. It's all green. So everything for him was green. And I think just really tapping into the, the simple things, the dollar tree, you know, as your best friend, as an educator, and you can find things that are really uh, relevant. And if a, if a family for reasons of, you know, socioeconomic reasons cannot afford a therapy, um, there are things that you can do in the interim until you can get those therapies that are fun and engaging um, that I remember too, one time for um, the toddler class, the toddler class was struggling. It's a tough age. I really, you know, I've never did toddler classes like as a teacher, just administrator, but I would say, okay, that Lysol, you know, where the wipes come out. Okay. We're going to put some scarves in there and then they would pull them out. And that literally costs maybe a dollar and recycling things and using things and that are already available to you. So I think, and that was a long answer, but in short, <laughs> I think doing it in the child's natural environment is the best option and um, carrying those things to, to home too and giving the parents just those easy to do tools. And then they'll be like, oh, wow, these activities are so cute and I get dinner cooked. So, you know, it's a, it's a two in one for, for you, but um, I do think that is becoming more of a standard model of care is the push-in services. And I'm really, really um, happy that we are moving more towards that. Um, not to say that the pull-out method as far as in schools or going to a therapy center is is bad because obviously we want the child to get the intervention that they need and deserve. But um, when we can't offer it in their natural environment, I do think that's the most effective and happiest. It is. It is the most effective and happiest. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, did both of your children receive support in the early childhood classroom? And what was that experience like for you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, there is some PTSD that comes sometimes. I worked at one of the best early learning centers in our town and I worked there for a long time and I grew as a professional there, but I would be lying to, if I said there wasn't some PTSD. They wanted to kick my son out almost immediately um, because we hadn't gotten his diagnosis yet. He, he was diagnosed with a language delay, but that was because the pediatrician would not help me. Um, yeah, so I had to remind them of laws, and that was very hard while I was working there. But luckily, I'm a tough cookie. <laughs> I I had to educate them. Just because my child is different doesn't mean that he can't get the the help. And I worked very quickly to get him a one on one at school, so he could be with other kids. And then eventually, he went to a more specialized setting due to behaviors and things that I think he needed more help with. Um, my daughter, it's very different. And as Sandra said, you know 
in in we have to think about the biology too you know sometimes they say autism is a boy's disease because it's more diagnosed but unfortunately girls are experiencing the same things but it's more internalized so with my daughter she's just nine years old now um she got diagnosed with adhd at the age of five she was a daydreamer dramatic play was her favorite center to go into uh, she was hyperlexic, just like her brother, and the teachers really didn't know she could read. She could read at four years old, and um, I also was hyperlexic, so I think someone else mentioned this too. As a parent, I was, you know, diagnosed with high-functioning anxiety. We didn't really have all the knowledge we have now, and now I know I also have ADHD. Yeah. So going back to to them partnering, I think it took a lot of education and bravery on on my part to speak up and advocate for my child. And sometimes it wasn't the easiest thing to do. Uh, my daughter uh, happened during COVID. And so when I really noticed that she was having trouble attending to task and things like that was when I had to work with her because my job shut down for a while. And so um, we were thinking more on the gifted path, but you know, children with ADHD, smart, but scattered. And so you have to find the things that they excel in. Now, recently with the, the autism diagnosis, she's the most social person you will ever find. So there's misconceptions about specific disabilities as well. So it's, it can be a, a very intricate and complex thing. And with her, she very much internalizes and has emotional disruptions and usually at home because that's where she feels safe. And the teachers don't think anything's wrong with her because she has a hard time if she doesn't feel comfortable speaking up, speaking up about what is frustrating her. Or, or, you know, she had like three things in the classroom that were bothering her, the class pet, the music, and a smell. And she told me all about it, but the teacher said, why didn't she tell me about it? Or the teacher said, oh, I've had a child like that. And I said, like that, oh, with ADHD, I know exactly what to do. She doesn't need a 504. And I said, I am going to reinstate her 504 because she does need these. And even if you can't see it, these are the things she's struggling with. And we have to remember teacher curriculum is pretty broad and it, we're doing more now to include some of these neurodiverse techniques. And I think instead of judging a teacher, it's a very hard job. I know these educators on this chat will mm -hmm. agree with me. It's a very sacrificial job. It's a very heart job, you know, from the heart and they need support too from professionals on on how to incorporate these things they're trying to meet for example in my daughter's class 20 children's needs you know different backgrounds and i think we also have to think about cultural competence because we're a bilingual family where my husband comes from is south america where there's not a lot of knowledge or um you know resources for autism and so taking all this into account and i guess i should have said that's where i started my teaching journey and so that's a long story how I ended up there, but I had a child in my class with Asperger's. And so there was no plan. There was nothing. I just scooted his desk close to me and I figured out as, as I went. So I think you can find support in that if you create a loving and a kind and open environment and conversation with the teachers, you can figure out what works best for your child. But as a parent, sometimes you do have to advocate for that, even if it's uncomfortable. So we've had good and, uh, you know, not so great experiences, but I will say overall, um, the world is becoming more accepting and is understanding that our brains are different. And if they weren't, we'd all be doing the same things and nothing would change. So um, I'm happy to see that. And we do need to end the stigma because that's when we really do the best work is when we take off that pressure of oh, well, this person's different and we can't do it, but with the right support, you can. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And thank you for so courageously sharing your response to that question. Um, I, I want to say that I, I didn't mean to trigger any PTSD, but I know that in, your, in you sharing that experience, so many of our participants felt uh, seen and felt heard. So thank you so much. Um, I want to kind of continue what you just mentioned about ending the stigma um, and tackle a uh, widely held belief or, or a myth that some families and even educators have about um, a disability label, a disability diagnosis or label. 
um, are children who receive early intervention labeled with a disability for the rest of their lives? I, I often encounter parents that say they don't want their child to have a label, but I think they're being a bit short-sighted because they already have a label and it's not necessarily a positive one. And instead, when you bring that to the child and you tell them it's not your fault, this is something you have and we're gonna help you, it is empowering. They can say it out loud and they know, no, I, I have dyslexia. It's not that I'm stupid. I just struggle in this way and it, I can, I'll, I'll be fine. So we have to normalize that. Oh, wow. Yes, I uh, definitely um, hear what you're saying. And I think that I've uh, this, I can honestly say I've been working in the field for a very long time and I've never heard uh, a response uh, to this question framed that way. Um, your child already has a label. If um, if an educator, if a professional or a parent themselves has already noticed um, there are differences in their child, chances are uh, their peers or their teachers have already labeled them. And so let's work on, on reframing how we talk about their needs um, and how we support them and how we make them uh, advocates for themselves. Like you said, giving them the power to say, I'm not stupid. I have, you know, I struggle in this area and that's why I need the support. So thank you. Um, we are getting ready to close out. We have about 10 minutes left and I really, uh, well, I have several other questions. I have some that are very specific uh, for, for the end of our panel. Um, I, again, want to thank you all for, for what you shared with us so far. I, if, I don't know if you're paying attention to the chat, but there's so much. Um, in the chat in terms of gratitude for, for all the messages you've shared. I would like to know um, if you could tell us, each one of you in your own words, um, what you feel ha is the greatest benefit to teachers around early detection um, or screening. So how do teachers benefit from learning more about screenings like they've done today um, and from learning more about early detection? Uh, you get to be the hero. You have to get to make even a bigger difference and help that child and their family. Yeah, you get to really make a difference in a child's life. These early identification and services can prevent lifelong problems um, for children and challenges and for families too. And the ELC can help support families. And we know you do not have a ton of time as teachers to be following up, you know, in the classroom with the children, yes, but but identifying these things early, um, the ELC, the warm line, help me grow, these different kinds of programs can really help connect families to meaningful services that could impact that child and family's relationship and the child's trajectory for the rest of their lives. So you are heroes at this really important developmental stage for children. I think, you know, I'm, I'm all these different things, a mom and an educator and, but, you know, I've gotten to see firsthand the children that were the most challenging quote unquote in my class made me grow as a person, as a professional. And I think um, now some of them are in, well, high school. I don't want to age myself, but um, my little guy from Peru is in high school. He's about to graduate and his mom writes me frequently and says you changed his life and I think that's why teaching is so important everything starts with the teacher if you're a lawyer if you're a doctor if you're a celebrity you remember your teachers so you have that ability to be that child's first cheerleader really in getting them started you know and what is a lifelong education really so I think uh, getting teachers the efficacy you know feeling like they are empowered to um, handle whatever comes their way is really important. And I think it is the most beautiful job there is. I'll second that too. I, I miss being a teacher. It is a wonderful job. And you are that person who's kind of in the middle and you can be that conduit that really can be that connection 
between the family and those helpful services. Um, so like Liz was saying, you can make huge differences, not just for the child, but also for the family. That empowerment is so important. And I just want to one thing that keeps has come up to my into my mind so many times during our conversation a couple different things but one of them is the systems and the importance of systems and i remember like when i was a teacher i didn't really think about that that much but but now just thinking about teachers need support they need a lot of support they need that training when i went into the early childhood field I did not have a degree in early childhood. I'd had no training, but I loved working with little kids. And I was lucky to work for a program that would send me to conferences and send me to these trainings and that trainings. And I, I was hungry for it. And I, I just did as much as I could. And I learned so much that way. Um, but those things just don't happen magically, right? They happen like super screening Saturday events. That takes <laughs> a lot of organization. It takes resources. It takes supporting the people who are organizing this and so it's it's the systems for supporting teachers for getting coaches for getting trainings um that's that takes advocacy for those resources too and then the training or this the screening systems like what's going well what's not going well so um what can be changed what can be improved what can make it easier for parents to complete these tools what can help teachers and then the flip end what do we do when concerns come up so it's such a big piece of this and advocating um i just want to put a plug in for advocating for more resources for teachers and more resources for systems and liz and i are so lucky to be in florida doing this work because somebody advocated for us to come here and dig in and work with florida around screening and their systems and you know we can just do the best training in the world but if the system doesn't accept what we're training people to do it's not going to go very far so there's that kind of overarching piece to be thinking about too so um i don't know why i wanted to say that but it just kept coming up in my brain <laughs> I think it was really valuable and it's it's very um inspiring I guess is the best word that I could really come up with to just hear what everyone is sharing and to know what's already happening in the background I know that we are meeting with Sandra to figure out ways to make trainings not only accessible but CEU bearing um, for educators and for families around the topic of early literacy and dyslexia. So those of you on the chat that want more about to learn more about this, um, we're on it. We're on it and we are connecting. And um, this project that brought Super Screening Saturday forward is from the Division of Early Learning. Um, it, the goal is to improve the supports that we offer you around the ASQ, around developmental screening and around access to early intervention, but also around inclusion. Um, I know that many of you have shared from personal experiences that you have children with disabilities or that you have children with disabilities um, in your home and your classroom. And um, you heard from Christina, you know, about the value of making sure that um, you, your child, whether they have a disability or do, or do not, spend as much time together, learning together as possible. Um, and we are, we are working on getting all of those things to you um, so that you can, you can feel like the superhero that you are. Um, we have about seven minutes, and so I'm hesitant to jump into another question. I love that we're ending um, on such a positive note. I want to take the time to thank you. Um, thank you, the participants, all of you who've uh, uh, been here with us this morning. I want to thank our panelists, our inclusion screening and assessment team, um, and our PDI faculty for all of the hard work that you put in. I wanna thank all of the presenters as well from our earlier sessions, if you're still signed on. I wanna thank our interpreters. Our interpreters um, have been instrumental in getting this information out to all of our uh, families and our communities in their native languages. And I am excited about um, what this, uh, what sharing this information in our mother tongues, right, can do for our community um, in terms of empowering educators and professionals. Um, I hope you sign off today and don't sign off yet. I'm not asking you to sign off. We still have a raffle um, and we have closing remarks, but I hope that when you do sign off today, you feel incredibly proud of uh, your participation today, whether you led a discussion or you ask questions, or you sat back and took it all in. 
um, the children you love and care for are closer to reaching their full potential because of the decision that you made to join us here today. Um, so thank you so, so much. I see that one of our support teams has raised your hand. And Marie, did you want to jump in and say anything? Hi, I just wanted to say uh, some of the participants have asked where they can follow you and listen to your recommendations and advice. Um, they're loving everything that they're hearing. Um, so I think uh, with Christina's suggestion and a lot of the things that have been shared by all our panelists, Gentina, Liz, and Sandra, I think it would be really great to put together some sort of a Padlet or resource uh, link where we where we can share this with everyone who signed on today. Um, that contains direct links to the ASQ website, direct links to um, the CDC website, direct links to the Lucy Project. Um, and other literacy resources. And so um, I this is not something that we've done in the past, but I think that just given the, the engagement and the questions in the chat, I think it would be really great. Pamela, um, definitely jump in. I think anyone can at this point uh, mute themselves and, and share because I'm kind of <laughs> running off. <laughs> I wanted to mention just really quickly, since I've been manning the chat, I just want to say, although we didn't get to every single question, we touched upon so many of your questions today. And I just want to say in summary to so much of the gratitude that I've seen in the chat, um, everyone has been commenting on how special this training has been, how much they're taking away today. And I just want to make sure that I mentioned that and how empowered they're feeling. So that's the overall feeling in the chat. And I just wanted to communicate that to you all. So thank you so much for what you've shared today. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, Annabelle. And thanks to everyone. I would like to mention that if you look um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a little button that says resources. Um, if you click on links, you will, you will notice the Lucy Project direct link, the Epilepsy Alliance um, website, and also the ASQ website that will take you directly to, um, to there. So if you visit, you will, you will have all, all the resources that you need. I also, um, if you click on documents, um, Ms. Ms. Bermudez was so kind to share with us upcoming things in the community, so you are able to download those. There is also a tra training document in there that you are able to download, so please feel free to go ahead and review all of these resources that are available to you. And once the Padlet is up with more updated resources, we will go ahead and share everything with you today. Thank you. Pamela, and I just wanted to add that we will be posting the recordings on the PDI website um, within the next few weeks, and we'll send everybody links to that so that you all can go back and, and listen uh, to anything that you might want to uh, go into again. Thank you, Anna. Can I put in a quick plug just because I want to make sure everyone knows about this because it's easy to get overwhelmed for the ASQ newsletter? Um, I put in the chat, please sign up for the ASQ newsletter if you're going to use this tool on a regular basis, good helpful information comes out and I know that question earlier about how can, can how much training is important for teachers. This is a great resource because you'll get little bits of training and little bits of information just kind of in your inbox, maybe twice a month and as a trainer. I swear I learned something in that newsletter every single time it comes out. So just we'll set we'll put the link in there for resources and stuff, but ASQ newsletter, sign up if you're going to use the tool. 